everyone, my name is Will Farrell, and it is my pleasure to say, welcome to the Graham Norton Show. and welcome to the show. Hey, there's been some easing of lockdown this week. The government has announced that soon primary schools will reopen all over the country. Kids heard the news, teachers heard the news, and parents heard the news. Yay! Hey, we've got a packed show for you tonight. We've got the comedy genius Will Ferrell, the Hulk himself, Mark Ruffalo, Poe star and fashion icon Billy Porter, plus the stars of the hit new drama Normal People, that's Paul Meskell and Daisy Edgar Jones. They'll all be joining us. But we begin with the funniest woman in Britain. It's only Miranda Hart. Hi, Miranda. Hello to you. Have you been spending all of lockdown making cushions? What, what do you think? I'm just making an area look socially acceptable with a lot of coloured cushions. What do you think? <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. good. I mean, it's a distract it's like... from the fact that I can't cut my own fringe. But also, there's the impression that like real life Miranda falls over as much as fictional Miranda. That you need a lot, a bank of cushions all around the room. This is padding, <laughs> constant padding, surrounding me. <laughs> Uh, I did a very Miranda thing the other day, can I just say? Oh, yes. Resume. Do you want me to share? <laughs> oh, please. Uh, my, my, my dog is 13 in uh, June and she's gone deaf so, sort of over the last four months. And normally I would just go wee wee to do, you know, to do a wee wee, which was nice and gentle. And now I have to literally go wee wee with her <laughs> staring at me, not, which is really embarrassing. And there's a little green, sort of pr public green at the back of where I am. And I couldn't get her back because obviously she can't, she can't hear um, her name. And so I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to go out. But I was just in a towel and I had to get her back. Walked out and somebody was doing a live um, Zoom uh, sort of PE class with me walking in the background in just a towel, <laughs> shouting, wee wee, Peggy! <laughs> so that's my Miranda story for you. And I hope at Christmas there we saw you celebrating 10 years of Miranda, which must, I mean, you know, just on a personal level, you must, that must give you a kind of a warm feeling that kind of like, I did this thing. Yeah, it was sort of a mixture of initially really embarrassing thinking, am I allowed to celebrate? You know, I was sort of hosting a show <laughs> celebrating myself. So there was that initial sort of British, oh, this is a bit awkward. And then I just thought, do you know, fuck it. The show did really well and I'm allowed to celebrate it and be proud of it. And so to celebrate that and then what the show's meant to people, that was the biggest surprise. Because I guess at the time you are just busy writing jokes, you just wanted to be funny. But actually, in hindsight, that show had a sort of message. Yeah, I, th I think suddenly realising, I mean, after the sort of second series, when I started getting letters from particularly teenage girls or women in their 20s sort of saying, are you really happy with that? with my anxiety or helping me feel that I can accept myself. You know, if Miranda can accept herself, then I can. You know, I'm allowed to be tall, I'm allowed to eat, I'm allowed to be big and loud and celebrating female friendship and not needing romance and all that sort of self-acceptance and self-compassion. And I started thinking, wow, I'm writing something much more with a heavier subtext than I thought. And obviously, I think subconsciously, there was obviously a lot more <laughs> going into the writing than I realised. So it was, it was kind of cool to... To acknowledge that. And obviously, as you said, Miranda moments still happen to you, but uh, Miranda moments happen to other people. And I know you encourage people to, to share them with you online. Yeah, with the, with the, one of the things of the 10th anniversary show is we got a hashtag Miranda moments going on social media. And there were just, I mean, I, I didn't know what response we'd get, whether we'd get any material from it. Honestly, we could have made about six shows. There were just so many. And uh, I think my favourite one that we actually did on the show was a woman who, who um, opened her front door and she thought that her uh, grandson was arriving. And so she got down on her knees to greet him and open the door. But she, she didn't realise that actually it was her postman at the door and she didn't have enough time to calibrate. And she was staring right at his crotch and went, hello, little man. <laughs> so good. I could just share so many. They were brilliant. Uh, but we haven't lost you as a performer. Uh, earlier this year, we saw you in the big screen adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. And I'm so glad to talk to you because you were brilliant in it, Miranda. You were so good in that movie. 
Oh, thanks, Graham. That means a lot. You know, it's so nice as a comedian to have the chance to do some of the acting. I love it. And apparently you really bonded with the director. Oh, my gosh. Autumn to Wild. Honestly, if you haven't seen... Guys, if you haven't seen Emma, it's online now and you have to see it. It's just beautiful. Me and Autumn just connected because she's six foot two as well. And within 15 minutes... Oh, actually, I'm six foot and three quarters of an inch. She's taller than me. Very important, <laughs> these things. And uh, within 15 minutes, we were crying, sharing what it was like to grow up being tall and also from the mundane things like, don't you hate bed ends? Why do people put bed ends? They can't fit in beds. <laughs> And just the sense of just, as a woman, just feeling so big at times. And, yeah, 15 minutes, we were weeping and sharing. And, um, yeah, I feel like I found an older sister in her. So it was amazing. Oh, what a great experience. And, listen, if people do want to see Emma, as Miranda says, it is available to rent online now. Uh, Miranda, I'll let you get back to your cushions because that room could use more. <laughs> yeah, I need to make some more cushions. I'll plump these up. I'll, I'll work on it, Graham. I'll work on it. <laughs> If you could, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye, Miranda. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Edna -bye. Miranda was talking about there being caught up in a Zoom conversation, and she's not the only person to crash the background of somebody's video. Here's a nursery school teacher trying to read her children a version of Pop-Up Unicorn. Cupcake flies through the forest and flutters her beautiful wings. She's Aww. looking for her playmate. The horse is really bringing it alive. <laughs> that sounds... Oh. <laughs> That, that, that's more pop-up than we wanted. <laughs> Sleep well, children. Hey, my next guest is one of my favourite people. He's the Hulk. He's three times Oscar nominated and now he's the star of the powerful new drama I Know This Much Is True. It's Mark Ruffalo. Hi, Mark. Hey, Graham. How are you? I'm very well. You look quite rustic. Where are you? You know, we don't have high-speed internet at my house uh, where I am in upstate New York, and so I'm at a, air, a bed and breakfast that's down the street that's now closed, <laughs> uh, renting a room because they have high-speed internet. But look, it's, it's very cabin-esque. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's a satin sheet, by the way. <laughs> do, do you nap between zoom interviews <laughs> you know it i well, on that satin i could i could sleep a year <laughs> so this airbnb this is this is where you come to work yes because you've been doing is it called adr i think is it called adr when oh you yeah that's right yes <laughs> so adr is automatic dialogue replacement um and it's the final process of filmmaking where we clean up the, the sound of the, of the picture. And, uh, and so we haven't been able to do that because we're all in COVID. And so we have made history by, by doing Zoom, uh, ADR and post with um, seven people in different locations on Zoom um, running a post operation. And they sent me a... Um, my own little ADR studio over here, <laughs> which do you want to see? Yeah, go on. Yeah, let's let's have a let's have a tour. So this is the um, this is the system. <laughs> it's a computer, and it's a uh, mixing uh, a little mixer, and that runs to this, which is my <laughs> um, my little audio studio, the microphone, the. Um, the monitor and of course the pillows that deaden all the bouncing sound and usually this whole thing is covered with a um a down blanket a down comforter to um to deaden the sound of the room so we get that nice beautiful clear sound that they can manipulate anywhere they want no one is ever going out to work again are they now that we know we can do it from home <laughs> Buddy, I will never do um, disposable travel again. <laughs> this is the only way you'll ever get me there unless I'm on a vacation. <laughs> yeah, we're never seeing you in our studio again, essentially. This is, no, this actually, is Mark Ruffalo's final time on the show. <laughs> I love you guys so much. It's been a, a huge pleasure. I'm actually quitting <laughs> acting after all this. <laughs> Uh, do not quit acting. Your new show, I Know This Much Is True, it's a six-hour drama serial, and to describe it as a family drama is to undersell it so badly. I mean, this is such an intense story. Yeah, it's, it's one of those families that has some sort of curse on them. Um, 
and um, you know whether it's mental illness or um, you know their children uh, they don't know who their father is uh, twins um, cancer you know all, all the things that a family goes through the tragedies that a family goes through over the course of multiple generations packed into six episodes and it's got a fantastic cast but of course centrally you and you uh, playing the the twins was that always the plan yes that was and it was insane and uh, I don't know that I would do it again because it was such a massive undertaking and I went gray, completely gray, uh, wor working on this. Um, I, I literally, in a year's time, my hair went from salt and pepper to almost fully gray. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the logistics a bit more, but let's watch a clip. Um, okay. This is you as the brothers Thomas and Dominic. Here it is. It's time to pay. We're, we're going to pay yeah, the price. I don't mean and to change somebody, the subject. How's your coffee cart? How's your business? For the sake of cheap oil. How do we justify that? How's your business, huh? How are you to prevent the vengeance of God? We have no respect for human life. I don't know, buddy. What do you want to eat? Have you had time to look at the menu? You can't worship both God and money, Christian. I'll get a cheeseburger. No fries, salad on the side. What do you want? I want hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. Thank you. Thank you. You're a good brother to me. <clears throat> wow. It really is e extraordinary. Talk and about I, I playing to... with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, it's only now that I'm talking to you that my mind is thinking about the logistics of doing that. Because obviously, because the characters look so different, you can't just kind of nip in and do one or the other. So did you lose weight or gain weight? I did both. We knew that I wanted to put on 30 pounds, but uh, because I'm 53 years old, putting on 30 pounds and then trying to lose that would probably take me the rest of my life. And so <laughs> I lost 20 pounds to play Dominic. And then when I was done with Dominic, I put on the 30 pounds. Um, so I went in both directions uh, so that you'd have a, a greater sort of uh, disparity, but, but in a way that was more healthy for, for me to do. Wow. And obviously, you know, in, in things like The Hulk, you're used to working with green screen, but this is all, it's all real. Yes, this is, you know, we really wanted to stay away from the green screen technology if we could. We, we wanted to keep this as, as, as homemade as possible. But um, in some scenes we had to put my face literally on the other actor who played both parts uh, across from me for, for the show. You weren't talking to Air. There was, there was an actor there. No, no, that was one of the things. Derek's like, we need a real actor for you to be playing off of. So, you know, he, he hired um, a, an old friend of his, Gabe Fazio, who, who, who lost the 20 pounds and put on the 30 pounds, who came in every single day in character, who gave the performance of a lifetime that you that you will never see, which is really the sad part of, of all this. This guy was so good. At one point I said, Derek, why don't we, can't we just make him look like me? And so <laughs> they had a mask made for him. I, I think I sent it to you guys. Yeah, they, they got a, a picture of the mask. Yeah, do you want it? did you get it? Yeah, now, <laughs> I don't know how much money you spent on that mask. That was like 20 grand, man. <laughs> It just looks like Halloween. <laughs> it looks fucking terrifying. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Like, even at Halloween, people wouldn't know who you've gone as. No. Like, who, who are you supposed to be? No, it was a disaster. Um, listen, thank you very much, Mark Ruffalo. Uh, new episodes of I Know This Much Is True air on Sky Atlantic on Monday nights at 9pm. It's also available on Now TV. Uh, Mark, a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of lockdown. Thank you. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye, a lot. Bye, Graham. OK, my next two guests have shot to fame as the stars of the hit new BBC drama, Normal People. Before we meet them, let's see a clip. Marianne. Marianne, there's someone I want you to meet. This is Connell. Oh, right. Hi. Connell Waldron from Beyond the Grave. 
When did you take off smoking? We were at school together. No way! Garrett! Yeah, he's here. What, he's here. what is it? Come here, man. You're going to want to hear this. Back in a sec. Well? How are you? Yeah. I'm all right. Good. Do you like a drink? Oh, Gary gave me this, so... We can do better than that. Very good. And the stars of Normal People join me now. It's Daisy Edgar Jones and Paul Maskell. Hello. 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 How are you? Hi. Uh, I'm very impressed by your coordinated backgrounds. <laughs> do, you, do you call each other? Yes. <laughs> Last night there was a dedicated <laughs> phone call to grey backgrounds, I think. <laughs> it's actually kind of cool about um, trying to spice them up a bit as well. So um, I've, I've put some flowers in. Yeah. Paul, no spice? I, no, I, I had... Um, I decided against this. I think it took up the majority of the frame, and uh, I think that was a good decision. <laughs> so it'll stay in the corner. Yeah. You don't want to be upstaged by a pot plant at this no, stage no. in your career. No. If it's going terribly, I'll just hide behind it. So. <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll creep in like David yeah, Triffitt. It's doing that now. Uh, so listen, congratulations. I mean, it's one thing to be in a hit, but this has turned into a sort of phenomenon, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit... I know that's not a question. <laughs> You're just going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're amazing. Thanks, Graham. Bye. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that you say that, though, to be honest, because it does. It's hard to kind of uh, to believe that to be the case, because you know we're we're just kind of in our front bedrooms and and whatnot. Like, it's very hard to believe that that people have actually seen it and and do seem to be liking it. It's, it's very surreal. Well, do you get calls about kind of breaking all the records? Because what do I like? Last week on iPlayer, something like it's got to thirty million requests now on iPlayer. It's broke. It's the most requested thing ever. That's not even a number that I can like compute. And then you're getting like emails from the producers of the show, and they're like, "This is this is the number." And I'm like, "That sounds really good and really brilliant." But it's <laughs> it's it's not something I think both of us definitely anticipated so it's all just been it's been good news after good news for the last uh, two weeks it's just been crazy yeah and because of the nature of the show I mean, it must be odd obviously that strangers are watching it but because of the explicit scenes uh, is it weird <laughs> like friends family paul did you was it your great aunt got warned off yeah it was so i had obviously discussed it through my parents i was like mum and dad you'll be well able for this but it might potentially be a bit of a stretch for like grannies and granddads so um my granny uh my granny claire as i call her warned <laughs> warned my grand auntie she's like now mary there's a lot of sexy bits in it so when you feel like it's about to start do a little job like go off and do something so it was in episode two and we started like kissing or whatever and mary's like oh this is the bit <laughs> so she went out and she's like i'm gonna put the dog out and come back in and i'll take my time but i think she uh, she underestimated the time it was going to take so as she was coming back in we were right in the in the throes of it so she waited outside the, she waited outside the door and just waited for the sound to stop so uh, oh God. i think a good long um chore might do the trick like a couple of cups of tea and then you should be safe <laughs> my poor dad um, he, he, um, he, because he's like, my mum and dad have sort of pre-watched it, so they kind of knew what to prepare for, but then, you know, because everyone's doing quizzes at the minute, um, he got, like, the call to do a Zoom quiz, so he paused it, and he was halfway through the quiz, he just went and looked up and hadn't realised exactly what bit he'd paused on, <laughs> so he was, like, having to manically fast-forward, because, obviously, not, not ideal. <laughs> no, his friend's thinking, that's your screensaver? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, uh, the two of you, not the only breakout star from the show, I give you Connell's Chain. Uh, Connell's Chain, now look, it's, it's got its own Instagram page, I think. There it is. <laughs> it's got 50,000 followers. It's crazy. It's gone nuts. <laughs> yeah. And people like tweeting about the chain to everyone watching normal people on a scale of 1 to 10, how badly do you want to be the chain around Paul Meskel's neck? I'm 11. <laughs> I think she means on the on the on the scale. On the scale. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Fingers I'm crossed. <laughs> uh, to the chain around Connell's neck is my religion. Uh, just a girl standing in front of a chain, asking you to be Connell's chain. Uh, this one. I like this one. I'm not even joking though. I'd shag that chain. <laughs> I don't know mechanically how that would work, but. <laughs> but then, then bad news arrived last week, where we read that. 
Daisy Edgar Jones had lost Connell's chain. Now, I dispute this. Paul I... didn't realise that I didn't lose the chain. What actually happened is I had to take it for pickups because we did some pickups actually kind of very soon before um, lockdown, we did a, a couple of pickups. So I brought the chain and Lorna, our lovely costume lady, she kept hold of it in case we needed to do any more. And then recently she, um, along with a lovely note, so, that's so weird that I just have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is this old thing? <laughs> <laughs> what a very small house. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, Connell's chain right here. And I actually, oh, no one, no one cares is. quite as much, but I also have Marianne's ring, which is, um, I think, great. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> yeah. No yeah. How many followers does that have, Daisy? <laughs> Pathetic. No, I mean, there's a Marianne's band on Instagram, but we yeah. that's not got quite as many followers, but hey-ho. <laughs> hey-ho. Hey-ho. Here's the joke. <laughs> Beautiful. And Paul, what's the story with you and Pavarotti? Was it, it, it's in Italy, I think. Was it on your last night in Italy that you had quite a, a big night out? The, st <laughs> uh, the story with me, um, I'm, I'd be a big fan of, of El Pavarotti. And um, yeah, I think I, around that time, I'd watched the Pavarotti documentary and kind of fallen viciously in love with the man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah when we, we, we went to this, we booked this Airbnb with a balcony and, and Paul, like... <laughs> Did a bit from it. <laughs> so, was it you that filmed this, Daisy? Actually, I think it was my... F I got hold of the video. I don't, didn't tell Paul okay. what I was Have you seen this, Paul? You must have seen this. Uh, back in the day, I've seen it, and I fe I'm well, feeling I know what you're about to bring up. Yes. So, this is, this is, this is Paul uh, channeling Pavarotti uh, in, in Rome. Here we go. Vincero. <laughs> Look at the poles, like. Vincero. No. <laughs> the oh, no, Delight it with himself. <laughs> Paul does this angelic performance from the balcony, and then I'm in the background, like da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Hey guys, lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much, and congratulations on everything. Uh, Normal People, the entire series is available on BBC iPlayer, and episodes seven and eight continue on BBC One, Mondays at nine. Daisy and Paul, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, now, one of the big events that got Corona cancelled this year is, of course, Eurovision, the Eurovision Song Contest. But worry not, Eurovision fans, because a new film tells the story of a fictional Eurovision entry from Iceland, and its creator and stars with me now, Will Ferrell. Hey! Hello! Hello, Graham. Hello. <laughs> I have my Eurovision jacket on, ready to go. It's perfect. Uh, so this is uh, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga. And I think it's one of those things... To find an American who's heard of Eurovision is astonishing enough. But you're a fan of Eurovision. How did this happen? Well, this happened uh, literally 20 years ago, uh, visiting my wife's family in Sweden. And uh, we, uh, one evening, uh, her cousin said, shall we sit down and watch Eurovision? I said, OK. And we proceeded to sit there for three straight hours and watch the Eurovision finals while my mouth was <laughs> slack jawed. I could not believe what I was watching. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. I mean, everything that you guys know, the spectacle, the, uh, the humor in it, the camp, and, and then the music, it was just intoxicating. And I, I always thought someone's gonna make a movie about it and no one ever had. And we started kind of getting this ball rolling about four years ago. And talking of Eurovision, there's been a few years where, you know, backstage is what Will Ferrell's here, Will Ferrell's here. <laughs> um, like, I've been feeling like, that film's never happening. He's been, <laughs> but now here it is. Yeah. And listen, you've done such a good job. We've got a clip of uh, you as one half of Fire Saga performing one of your songs. Okay. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Um, seriously, I, you know, as someone who's watched a lot of Eurovision, <laughs> it's so close because it's a hard thing because you can't really parody it because it's so yeah. mad you just have to get it right yes we uh i mean we really owed it to i think eurovision and the fans to make sure that it was well observed and uh you know so many of the eurovision songs 
can be silly, but they're they're catchy. They're catchy, and uh, and so we that's kind of what we were aiming for. And and Fire Saga, I think, has some appropriately good bad songs. <laughs> But in your visits to Eurovision, I know you've been inspired by some acts. You've sent through uh, a list of some of the acts. One of them is quite old. I think this is 1979. This is yes. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan from Germany. What's more appropriate than singing about the conquests of Genghis Khan? I mean, look <laughs> at those outfits. It's amazing. And it's like Oompa with a disco beat. It's really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now we've got more up to date, of course, from Finland, yeah. uh, Lordy. And... and <laughs> We have an act in, in our movie that parodies them as well. Uh, I think that's just one of the classic images when you think of Eurovision. I, say, I don't think I've ever seen that picture before. I like them holding flowers. Lordy <laughs> holding bouquets of flowers. Right. Yes. They didn't know Lordy were going to win when they made the bouquets of flowers. No, they had no idea. Yeah. And, uh, and also, there's a, a sort of side to European culture that's hard to explain, like the uh, Polish milking. Polish made. milkmaids. I just thought this was uh, how they milk things in Poland. I, I don't find it erotic at all. <laughs> Sexy butter. It's just someone, yeah, just someone making butter. Right. <laughs> uh, and this act, the Ukrainian act, really inspired you, the man in the hamster wheel. Yes, and that is something we lifted directly and put into the movie. We kept thinking of something for when Fire Saga is singing their song Double Trouble uh, on the stage. We're like, what would be the stage? And I'm like, we should we need to do something like that guy in the hamster wheel we saw. And and next thing you know, the the prop department is constructing a massive steel hamster wheel for me to run in, uh, which is one of the more frightening things I've ever had to do because I was lowered about 50 feet from the air down to the ground in a massive hamster wheel. Uh, but so glad we did it. <laughs> yes, it's funny. And uh, something we've been doing, Will, is talk, we're talking to actors uh, from their own homes. We're just seeing, you know, anything they've nicked from film sets. Let's call it memorabilia. Yes. Uh, do you, <laughs> have you got anything good at hand? Oh, I've got a couple things. I've got, uh, I hope you can see it. This first item is my, my Channel 4 news ring from Anchorman, which is, uh, yes. Ron Burgundy wore this on every day of filming, which is a classic. And then I have one other item, which, which is in a special cardboard box here. And these are my uh, prosthetic testicles from Step Right. <laughs> Very lifelike. And uh, I have brought these out. Uh, much to the horror at many a dinner party, I presented these. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these these fake testicles were what were put on uh, Brennan's drum kit, Dale's drum uh, kit. Th there's going to be a screen grab of that that's going to go viral. <laughs> <laughs> With just some bollocks in your face. <laughs> uh, Will Ferrell, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga, starts streaming on Netflix from June 26th. Uh, thank you so much, Will. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Graham. Bye. OK, time for another of our very special home performances. And tonight it really is special. We've got the Emmy, Grammy, Tony winning star of Pose. It's Billy Porter. Hello, Billy. Hi, Graham. How are you? I'm not as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for being so fabulous. Look at you. <laughs> Those glasses well, are stunning. Coming on Graham Norton, darling. Have you been bedazzling in lockdown? <laughs> No, these were bedazzled for me. Of course. He doesn't do his own bedazzling. No, darling. <laughs> and we love, we love Pose over here uh, in you. Britain. Had you filmed some of season three, all of season three? What's the story? We were eight days in to episode one of season three. Oh. Before we got shut down. So we're shut down indefinitely, but um, I did get an email the other day that said they're going to pay us something. So... That's good news. Hey, those glasses don't buy themselves. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. They also don't buy your outfits, your red carpet outfits. You know, you've, you've become the king of the red carpet. We've got that amazing one, you at last year's Met Gala. Yes. Now, no Met Gala this year, but you set people a kind of quarantine challenge. Yes. You? To um, sort of just give a little levity to people. You know, take stuff from around your house and recreate some of my looks. And so uh, Anna Wintour and the Met Gala people at Vogue 
uh, thought that it was a good idea and some of those looks that people did. I know. I can only imagine what Anna Wintour thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> that is stuff she wrote her house. This man, I mean, he's made that. I know. He? I know these people have made this stuff. There was somebody that made a, an entire dress out of newspapers. And of course that man, he went to all that trouble, but no one told him you can't compete with a dog. <laughs> Yes, the children are dressing their dogs up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so listen, Billy Porter, what are you performing for us tonight? Uh, so I am doing my new uh, song, a remake of Buffalo Springfield's For What It's Worth. It's a protest anthem, uh, perfect for this time period, produced by Zach Arnett of Sir. And uh, there are very special background vocals that I did specifically for you, only for you, darling. Oh, we thank you. Uh, here, performing for what it's worth with Billy Porter on backing vocals, it is Billy Porter. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. Got to be aware. I think it's time we stop. Children, what's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. Fantastic. Billy Porter and Billy Porter and Billy Porter. That was uh, beautiful. Thank you Remember very, very boat. much. Well, you know, when we get the chance, we will. That's what that's about for me. <laughs> so the, the message is get to vote, but you're also involved in a special charity event I know you wanted to mention. Yes, I'm going to talk about the One Love auction is happening on Thursday, uh, when we will be auctioning off loads of incredible lots donated by amazing artists. All the proceeds will be going to NHS Together Charities and Feeding America in the US. Well, listen, I hope that's a huge success, uh, Billy Porter. Thank you so much for joining us. And you must come and see us in the flesh when things are back to normal. Yes, I'm so looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Billy Porter, bye-bye. See you soon, bye. Bye, bye-bye. Uh, well, it's been a packed show, but I think we can squeeze in a quick red chair. Uh, who's there? Hi there. Hello. Uh, nice job with the chair. Where are you? I'm in Dublin. Dublin. And what's your name, sir? Uh, Loic. Loic? Yes. OK. Uh, off you go with this story. So when I was about 10, my parents brought me to Belgium on a family holiday, and they have a landmark called the Mannequin Piss, which is a statue of a little boy peeing. Yeah. And I was seeing this everywhere, and I found this hilarious. And then we <laughs> went into a gift shop, and they had a little miniature version of it with a little button underneath. So I went over to it, pressed the button, and it started hissing. So it was like, Psst. and I found this hilarious. So I was like calling my mum over. I was like, you can hear him peeing. So I held it up to her ear and it turns out the hissing was a gas because it was a lighter. And I set my mum's hair on fire in the shop. <laughs> Very good. You can walk. Off you go, sir. Thank you. Excellent. Well done. That was good at everything. The pissing, a mother with her hair on fire. Bravo, Loic. And that's all we've got time for tonight. If you'd like to share your Red Chair story from anywhere in the world, just use the address on your screen now to get in touch. And remember to leave a contact number. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, when my guests will include John Legend, Alan Carr, Dakota Johnson, Steve Carell, and Katy Perry. See you then. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.